Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. A warm welcome for those who may be visiting today. And we pray that as we all gathered in today, we will find the warmth of fellowship and the warmth of the Spirit with us this day. Isn't it a gorgeous, hot, muggy morning? Not complaining at all, at all. Because you know what? January is coming. <laughs> I went into shed the week, and the first thing that met me was a snowblower. I was like, that's an omen in itself. Some announcements that I want to highlight for upcoming days and weeks. Um, again, this is a scent free facility. A scent free facility. Um, that means no scents. Maybe we're just better than that. No sense in this place. Uh, <laughs> please be aware of perfume, aftershave, anything that leaves a scent. We have members of our family, of our congregation family, that have severe allergies, and we want to make this a safe space for all who come into this place. Chapel this afternoon at Hillcrest Estates at 3 p.m. If you have a free hour to come up, and uh, joining with the residents of Hillcrest Estates for some worship. Please join us there. VBS is coming, fast and furious. Uh, so there will be some, uh, some things happening, building, painting, all of the above. If you, and plus for that week, if you are willing to help and volunteer, please let Lisa know, right? Let Lisa know. And there are still one, two, three, four, five, six shields on the back wall for supplies or food uh, that we need for that week and I would love to see them gone uh, today. Uh, so please if you can take a shield uh, for to help us out with some supplies that would be gratefully appreciated. After the service this morning uh, in the gym there will be ice cream for everyone not just for the children it's for everyone. There's toppings available, I think, or whatever. I'm not sure what's out there, but I know there's ice cream out there. So please join us after the service in the gym uh, for some ice cream. Uh, myself and my wife are headed off to Congress, Inspire, Conference in Congress this evening. Uh, so please, uh, if you have any, um, anything that comes up this week, that you need uh, help or need somebody, uh, Major Bob will be available uh, in our absence. And you can get a hold of Major Bob if you have the directory app on your phone or the directory. His number is in the directory. And you can reach him by that. If not, he tells me you can reach him by the yellow pages. And he's there. So <laughs> we can get him. We can get him. A couple of congratulations are in order this morning. A couple of congratulations are in order. First one to Marcus. Marcus is not here this morning. Marcus won Athlete of the Year from Mount Pearl Senior High uh, this past year. And that's an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And uh, knowing Marcus and his athletic ability, I'm not, not surprised. And the second one is to a teacher. And it's come to my attention. It has come to my attention. Miss Penny Pinson has received the Minister's Award for Compassion in Teaching. It recognizes the inspirational and compassionate teachers at the primary, elementary, or secondary level who have demonstrated an exceptional commitment to supporting the social, emotional, and mental health of their students, colleagues, or school community. It's an honor. That's an amazing award. And we congratulate you today. And it's no surprise that you received this award. Knowing you and knowing you for years, uh, it's no surprise that you've uh, received this award. And uh, huge congratulations uh, for that award, for that award. And that's enough from me this morning. And now the worship team will lead us in worship today. Good morning. Selected verses from Psalm 139. 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And so we're going to stand and sing, wherever I am, I'll praise him. Whenever I can, I'll praise him. For his love surrounds me like the sea. I'll praise the name of Jesus. Lift up the name of Jesus. For the name of Jesus lifted me. Please stand. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. And so we sing, I lift my voice in song unto thy name. I lift my hands, you're every day the same. We might change, he doesn't. Come fill me now, Lord Jesus, let it be. Let now my lips sing new found praise. To thee, let that be our prayer this morning.
called Bless the Lord, O My Soul, 10,000 Reasons. And Aubrey, I'm wondering if we could go to the second verse. Hmm. Bless the Lord, O My Soul, 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Yeah, that's a different one. That's okay, though. We're doing 10,000 reasons? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. There we go. No, not that one either. quiet in our hearts this morning for a time of prayer and I've asked the band to help us out with this uh, song this morning number 825 in your songbook it says a wonderful savior is Jesus my Lord a wonderful savior to me he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure 
I see. The second verse says, A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved, and he giveth me strength as my day. And there's many individuals today, many people today in need of that touch, in need of that strength. He needs to be held up. Remember Colonel Doug in these days on his own health journey, but also Colonel Doug and the Effort family, the passing of Colonel Doug's mom this past week as well. Um, the service will be 2.30 this afternoon from Trinity Bay South Core. Remember Kathy and the Frost family as well this week as Major Frost um, was promoted to glory as well a couple of nights ago. Remember that family today. We remember Commissioner Tidd uh, as well. Many of you may know that Commissioner Tidd uh, is on his own journey. Uh, with cancer, and as of September 1st, we'll be stepping away uh, for a short period of time of leadership of the territory um, to deal with some, uh, some health concerns. So we pray for him and Tracy and the family, and we also pray for our new commissioners who will be taking up leadership in September, uh, September 1st, and that would be Commissioner Lee and Debbie Graves who are coming back uh, to the territory as well. We also remember Sherry Burnable, that's Ethel and Enos's daughter, uh, who's having some health concerns, and there are many today, many others today who are battling today. Remember our service next Sunday in our absence. Nadine will be leading on our service next Sunday in our absence, and we pray for her as she uh, guided by the Holy Spirit for next Sunday morning. So please come out and support her as she leads on next Sunday morning. He holdeth me up. And I pray today that will be our prayer. We're going to sing the three verses straight through with the help of the band, please, this morning. <clears throat>
Father, this morning we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your care and your compassion. Fathers, we've gathered here this morning. We gather to worship, to praise, to uplift your name. We also bring before you those today who are hurting, those who are grieving, those undergoing treatments, those who are just not well, waiting for surgeries, recovering from surgeries. We pray, Father, that you will be with them today. That a touch of your hand will give them the strength that they may need. That they will feel and sense your presence in a real way today, wherever they may be. We pray for our students today, Father, as well as they head out for the summer, as school has ended for another year, our students and our teachers, as they brace themselves for the summer months, that you will protect them this summer, that you would guide them, whether that's just taking a break and enjoying the summer or working this summer, that you will bless them as well. We pray for our conference coming up in Toronto this week. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will indeed move amongst all those delegates that will be there, those who are in person, those who may be watching by a live stream as well this past week. We pray, Father, that we will be renewed, inspired, that your Spirit will indeed convict us of who we are individually and as a Salvation Army that you will bless those gatherings. Pray for our service next Sunday for Nadine as she takes leadership next Sunday and as she prepares her heart that you will guide and direct her thoughts, her words, that you will bless her indeed. We thank you, Father, for these opportunities these opportunities to uplift your name, these opportunities to pray for each other, to share each other's burdens, to share each other's grief and sorrows, to encourage one another. We pray for the remainder of our service this morning and that your spirit will indeed move amongst us this day. We ask all these things in and through your holy name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. My wife is going to come with scripture reading this morning, but before she do, I want to make mention, acknowledge another donation that came in uh, as a donation toward our live stream uh, and our PowerPoint equipment, and that's from Tina and Sean Stringer. We thank you so much for that gift uh, for to help us out in ministry and so that the gospel can be shared. Thank you so much. Good morning. Our last church, finally. It took us a long time to get through seven churches. A long time. Revelation chapter 4, verses 14 to 22. To the angel of the Lord in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich 
and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear that the Spirit says, what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Just to give you an update, a lot of you have been asking how my dad is doing, and we are quick to ask for prayer. But we're not always so quick to share answered prayer. So I want to give a good news report this morning. My dad's hemoglobin this week was double at what he was at his sickest point, And that's a big, big accomplishment. He has gone to church this morning feeling very well. And the doctor said we may see a difference by August or September. But God had better plans. And we saw a difference this last two, three weeks. So we're thankful for that this morning. And I praise God and thank him for his answered prayers. Now the band... Tithes and offerings. I didn't come up early this morning either. I think I'm in the right spot at the right time this morning. For those of you who were, who were here when I did this before, I came up and I was going to try to lead the band, but Glenn wouldn't let me. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so nice to see you all, and I'm so glad to be in this church this morning, and I hope and pray that all of you are too. Uh, Hebrews, th Hebrews 13 and 16 says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Would the ushers please stand for prayer, and I'll have a short prayer. Gracious and loving Father, we approach your throne with humble and sincere hearts as we thank you for all your abundant blessings to us every day. May we not withhold from you <clears throat> what we have decided in our hearts that belong to you. May you be honored with these offerings we present this day. Amen. children come up for children's time.
All right, before I start, I got to drink some water because I'm really thirsty. I was really thirsty. Raise your hand if you've ever been thirsty. You've never been thirsty, Samantha? <laughs> never. <laughs> well, I've been thirsty before, just like that. Today we're going to learn about a Bible passage that tells us to be thirsty for something. The, p- the passage is Psalms 42, verse 1 to 2, and it says, A deer longs for streams of water. God, I long for you in the same way. I am thirsty for God. I am thirsty for the living God. So can you guys tell me what the writer of this psalm was thirsty for? Can anybody tell me? Do you know something? Do you know what he was thirsty for? If somebody is feeling a bit hot. He was thirsty for God. The writer of the psalm was thirsty for God. But yeah, that's, that's sometimes you're thirsty when you're hot, yeah. So he is thirsty for God and he wants more of God just like how you want some water when you're tired or thirsty or hot. This verse reminds us that God refreshes and restores us when we spend time with him just like water refreshes and restores us when we are thirsty. This week, whenever you take a sip of your water, I want you to remember this lesson and tell God that you were thirsty for him. We're going to pray. Let's put one hand up. Lord, we thank you that you are refreshing like a cold drink of water. Help us to drink up your word. In Jesus' name, amen. There's no Sunday school today, so you guys can go back to your seats. Before Denzel comes and leads the next song, I just want to have a a prayer. Many of you probably don't know. Uh, We have a number of our young people who will be working at camp uh, this summer. Uh, we have Jordan, we'll be working at camp. We have Jared, we'll be working at camp. Georgia, who's in hotter weather than what we are right now, but she's also working at camp uh, this summer. Eva, our student uh, from Gander, is also working at camp this summer. And we also have Timothy's. Uh, Timothy is a discipleship program uh, for this summer. I think it's three weeks, am I correct, or two weeks? Two? Four weeks! Is four weeks at camp, and uh, Carly uh, will be going off to the Timothy program uh, this summer. Do I have them all? I think that's all of you. Yes. I'm going to ask you to stand. All of you. I'm sorry to put you on the spot this morning. Yes, Jordan, you have the stand. (laughs) I'm in trouble. No, just the just the camp staff. I'm sorry, just the camp staff, and. we're, we're going to have a prayer. Now, they're looking for camp staff, if you want to get on camp staff, uh, Linda and Maureen. <laughs> Let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you today for our youth. We thank you for their passion. We thank you for their lives, their commitment to you. And Father, as they head out this summer uh, to work at camp, to be discipled, at camp, but most of all, to have an impact on those kids who will be arriving at camp this summer. Father, we pray that you will just bless them, that you would empower them, that the love of Jesus will be shown in and through them this summer, so that those children who are coming from all walks of life will know that you love them and love them unconditionally. Again, Father, we pray you just bless our young people as they take leadership this summer. We ask in Jesus' name, giving thanks. Amen and amen. Going to share another song? if you're following in the psalm book, the words will be on the screen. I serve a risen Savior. He's in my heart world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. The Course says he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me. Along life's narrow way, he lives. 
salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. I invite you to stand again as we share the three verses through them. Have mercy, please. <laughs> Father, thank you for your son Jesus who came to be our Savior. And the moment we accepted him into our lives, we were able to sing, He lives within my heart. We thank you for this day and for your blessings upon our lives. We thank you for your spoken word as well. And as your servant comes now to share with us, some thoughts from your word that you have given to her. We would ask your blessing upon her and upon the message. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jerry Spence is a famous trial lawyer, the author of many books, including the book, Win Your Case. Part of Jerry's fame is attributed to his famous final plea in just about every closing argument. In his book, he speaks to the jury on behalf of little Polly. 
Spence says, before I leave you, I want to share you with the story I tell in nearly every case. It's about transferring the responsibility of the case from us, on behalf of little Polly and her parents, to you, the jury. It's a story of a wise old man and a smart aleck boy who wanted to show up the wise old man as a fool. One day, the boy caught a little bird in the forest. The boy had a plan. He brought the bird cup between his hands to the old man. His plan was to say, old man, what do I have in my hands? To which the old man would answer, you have a bird, my son. Then the boy would say, old man, is the bird alive or is it dead? If the old man said the bird was dead, the boy would open his hands and the bird would fly freely back to the forest. But if the old man said the bird was alive, then the plan of the boy was to crush the little bird and crush it until it was dead. So the smart aleck boy sauntered up to the old man and said, old man, what do I have in my hands? And the old man said, you have a bird, my son. Then the boy said with his malevolent grin, old man, is the bird alive or is it dead? And the old man with sad eyes said, the bird is in your hands, my son. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Spence would say, the case of little Polly is in your hands. In Revelation 3, 14 to 22, this final letter to the churches, there is also a plea, a final plea. Seven letters have been written from Ephesus to Laodicea. Although the churches were specific, although the letters were specific to each church, they would have been read by all the churches, addressing issues confronting the Christian congregations. This is Jesus' final plea, his last words to the church as a whole. And in verse 22, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus' final plea to the churches is, Repent, change your ways, be ready for my return. For his final recorded words in Revelation 22 reflect on his return. This final letter is addressed to the church in Laodicea. The city of Laodicea was located southwest of Philadelphia, due east of Ephesus. It was the wealthiest of the seven cities, being a banking center and a textile town, famous for the manufacturing of a rare, glossy black wool cloth. It also was the home of a medical school that produced a certain kind of eye ointment. Although the city was wealthy, it had a poor water supply. Its supply came from a six-mile aqueduct, bringing water from the south, from the hot mineral springs of Heropolis. By the time the water reached the city, it was tepid, lukewarm, mineral-laden, and just intolerable to taste. To this church, Jesus addresses himself as the ruler of creation, the amen, the faithful and true witness. The amen signals an acknowledgement of something true and binding. He is the truth and speaks the truth. Jesus is true and faithful. After Jesus addresses the crowd and introduces himself, he proceeds to speak to the church directly. This has been his format for all seven letters. His words are familiar. I know your deeds. These words have been used in five of the seven letters. To the churches at Ephesus, Thyatira, and Philadelphia, it has been followed by commendation. They have been praised for what they are doing right. However, for Laodicea, it is as it was with Sardis. This is a negative statement. Jesus is not pleased. Why? Because this church is lukewarm in their relationship with him. In verses 15 and 16, Jesus says to them, I know you inside and out, and I find little to my liking. You're not cold. You're not hot. Far better to be either cold or hot. Instead, you are lukewarm, tepid. You're stale. You're stagnant. Therefore, I want to spit you out of my mouth. Strong words. But they are appropriate for the culture and situation. Everyone understands how nasty and terrible lukewarm water tastes. Agree? Now God is using this as a comparison for their spiritual condition. And even without the background, the judgment is clear. 
God is very displeased with this church. So disappointed, he wants to spit them out. Spit them out. That brings many images to mind, doesn't it? Being sick and throwing up, you got no choice. Got to spit it out. A child tasting something that they don't agree with it. They find it yucky. What do they do? They spit it out. How nasty the church must have tasted in the mouth of God that he would want to spit them out. That he wanted them out of his mouth. One side note that I found while I was researching for this sermon stated that many would take the word cold to be negative. Hot positive, cold negative, with lukewarm being in between. But one Bible commentary believes that both hot and cold could be looked upon as positive. Jesus wishes that the church had a cold, refreshing purity or a hot therapeutic value, but as neither. The church at Laodicea is just lukewarm. Yet, what was it doing that made its behavior so repulsive and nauseating to Jesus? Jesus goes on to condemn its behavior in verse 17, and he says, You brag. I'm rich. I got it made. I need nothing from anyone. You claim to have everything when in fact you have nothing. You are oblivious to the fact that in truth you are a pitiful blind beggar wearing threadbare clothes and homeless. As a church, Laodicea is wealthy and luxurious. It is rich with all the material goods it would want. By today's standards, it has the great cathedral with the lavish meeting rooms, plush pews and carpet, and state-of-the-art technology. Jesus looks down and sees the highly trained preacher. He hears the fancy choir. He smells the soup in the kitchen. But it is of no value to him because they're all lukewarm in their relationship with him. The church has an attitude of self-sufficiency. They don't need anything. They're materially secure and they feel spiritually safe, totally unaware of their need. They're proud of themselves, their beautiful building, their rich treasury, and all that they have accomplished. They can see what they have, but they fail to see what they are lacking. There is no zeal, there is no warmth, there is no enthusiasm. They have become indifferent to the great doctrinal truths of Scripture. They have lots of activity, plenty of form, but they have little godliness. The only good thing they have is their opinion of themselves, and that's not true. The church at Laodicea is measuring its value by human standards, not spiritual ones. Wealth has deceived them. They do not have what they think they have. For the true source of wealth is God alone, and at the moment, he is not the focus of their congregation. In fact, he is outside looking in. They have become blinded to their needs and unwilling to face the truth. They are so proud of their status, but they're complacent in their spirituality, becoming different to spiritual matters, and they just don't care. Michael Wilcox says the worst condition to which a church can sink is lukewarmness. Jesus has chosen his words of rebuke carefully. In a city known for its bankers, doctors, and fashion industry, he describes the church as being poor, blind, and naked. Could he have rebuked them in a more negative way? Like the church at Laodicea, does the church today need a new measuring tape? At times, does the church measure its value by human standards? rather than spiritual ones? Many churches today have beautiful buildings, elaborate organizations, and top-notch technology, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not enough. Without sounding, sounding judgmental, is there a tendency to meet, to go through the motions, and go home, and still feel spiritually empty? Do we go home with the same empty souls with which we came to the service? Is there enthusiasm? Is there zeal? Is there fire? Many Christians may think they are just fine the way they are, yet they're indifferent to the fact that we can all be better. They are blinded to their spiritual condition. There is no one more difficult to reach than a person who is self-satisfied, 
complacent and blind to his own conditions. So I'll ask again, does the church today need a new measuring tape for its values? Hallelujah this morning. God has a plan. The great creator has a measuring tape to replace the old one, one that values our spiritual nature. In verse 19, Jesus explains to them what they can do. There is a plan. God is eager to work in their lives. Here's what I want you to do. Buy your gold from me, gold that has been put through the refiner's fire. Then you will be rich, rich by my standards. Buy your clothes from me, clothes designed in heaven. You've gone around half naked long enough. And buy your medicine for your eyes from me, so you can see, really see. Christ is the source of all true wealth, splendor, and vision. And Jesus wants them to be fully aware of this. Why does he offer them a plan? Why does he care? Why not leave them where they are? Why bother? Verse 19 answers that question. The people I love, the people I call to account, I rebuke, I discipline, I prod, I correct, I guide. Why? So that you will live your best life. You will be sincere. You will be honest. You will be earnest. You will repent and change your ways. Jesus is standing before the church. In verse 19, he says, Look at me. I stand at the door and knock. But he knocks at a door with no outside doorknob. And you must open that door. If you hear me call and open the door, I'll come right in and sit down to supper with you. Conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table, just as I, having conquered, took the place of honor at the side of my father. That's my gift to the conquerors. The only cure for lukewarmness is the readmission of the excluded Jesus. He wants to be on the inside. Jesus does not despair over the church at Laodicea. All is not lost. This is one of the most tender messages found in any of his letters. Jesus alone can provide the riches, the robes, and the ointments. And he is eager to walk in the life of the church. His tender voice invites Laodicea to accept his offer. He comes. He stands. He knocks. He calls. The question is, will she let him in? Jesus may be shut out. The church may be devoid of spiritual life, but yet he still appeals to the church. If anyone hears, if any man or woman, he appeals to individuals. If the whole church does not heed his warning, if one heart is open to receive him, Jesus will enter and stay in blessed fellowship. To those who repent, there will be a seat. A banquet, a place on the throne of heaven. The question is, will anyone come? This morning, this message is for all churches. Messages from Jesus belong to us today as well as the church of the first century. Churches are people and human nature has not changed. Warren Worsby challenges the reader of this letter not to look at the passage as ancient relic, but as a mirror in which we see ourselves. What is the mirror reflecting to us today? When we examine our hearts, do we see hearts with burning zeal? Do we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Or do we see hearts that are lukewarm, lacking zeal, warmth, and enthusiasm? Do we see hearts filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit? Or do we see hearts that are self-satisfied? The pleasures of this world, money, security, and material possessions can be dangerous because their temporary satisfaction makes us indifferent to God's offering of lasting satisfaction. The pleasures of this world, money, security, and material possessions can be dangerous because their temporary satisfaction can make us indifferent to God's offer of lasting satisfaction. When we look in the mirror this morning, what do we see? Do we see someone in need of a new measuring tape? Are our values measured by human standards 
or spiritual ones? Individually this morning, be honest with ourselves. Are we hot or are we lukewarm in our Christian experience? Or are we cold with purity? God knows this morning. I don't need to know, but God knows. Are you content and complacent where you are in your spiritual walk? Are you self-satisfied? I'm all right just as I am. Don't ask me to participate in ministry. Don't ask me to help out with Sunday school, VBS, or YP. Don't ask me to do a homely program. Sit on a kettle or volunteer for community events. Not likely. I often hear people saying, in many core, not just this one, I'm too old, I've had my day, let someone else do it, it's their turn. And in many ways, that may be true. But don't think you can't do anything. I was at a conference one and I heard the speaker say, if you're not dead, you're not done. There's always something to be done. As long as God keeps us on this earth, he has a purpose for our life. And when he's finished with us, then he calls us home. Jesus is telling us this morning, if we're not filled with zeal and enthusiasm for God, if we're not seeking out what God wants to do through us, then we're lukewarm. And we know what he does with those who are lukewarm. But praise God, he's not content to leave us there. He loves us too much to leave us lukewarm. He's knocking at our hearts this morning. He is eager to work in our lives, to enter and to fill us with his spirit. He is knocking. Will you let him in? He is eager, but he is also a patient God. He knocks, he waits. But it's up to us to let him in for salvation. To let him in, to allow the Holy Spirit to do work in our lives, to fill us, to lead us, to guide us. Today, he's knocking. Will you open the door and let him in? Shall we pray? Father, this journey through the seven churches, it's been a challenging one. It's been an encouraging one. I pray, God, that it's been a life-changing one. Even though this was written over 2,000 years ago, it's so relevant to us today. And I, God, I pray for the hearts that are in your presence right now in this building and online. I just pray, God, that they've been challenged by your word. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will speak. It is too easy to become complacent in our seats. It is too easy to come to church and say, I'm okay. I'm good as I am. I'm good where I am. But Holy Spirit, if you've got more for us to do, challenge us this morning, God. May we be filled with love, zeal, compassionate, your grace to share with others, to make a difference in this world. We are your hands and feet. May we be willing to use them for you. Move among us in these next few moments, we pray. In thy name, amen. Move, Holy Spirit, move in my life. Move, Holy Spirit, make me like Christ. Move. Don't leave me where I am. Move me. Move my heart. Move my willingness. Move me out of my complacency. Move, Holy Spirit. Move in my life.
Lord says, come Holy Spirit, I need you. Come sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own special way. It was just a few weeks ago. We were discussing the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost and, and at the Ascension and what that meant for the church and how incited they were because God had called them to do amazing things. And when we read that, it just seems so happening. But yet that same power and that same strength is available to us today. What happened 2,000 years ago is still available and still able to work today. God just wants us to be willing. He wants us to be earnest. He wants us to be enthusiastic for him. What do you need from the Holy Spirit today? What can he do in your life today? Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. that's a favorite of ours fan the flame in me could I have the words there Aubrey please Lord renew in me the fire of your spirit till I begin to see the power of your love make my life to be blazing blazing with your holiness consider that for a moment would you consider your life to be blazing with God's holiness father fan the flame in me to be holy for your honor, so that Christ be seen in me, to be holy for your likeness. Father, fan the flame in me. Let's stand together this morning as we sing this song. I pray as a song of commitment, a song of willingness. Father, fan the flame in me.
May that be our prayer today and as we go out into this week. We're going to sing one more song. 907 says, What a wonderful change my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul. Amen. For which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray, and my sins which were many are all washed away. Why? Since Jesus came into my heart. Four verses straight through. Band, please. ice cream out in the gym. We're all welcome to go out and cool off for a few moments with some delicious ice cream. Um, next Sunday, myself and Lisa will be away, so please can keep Nadine in prayer as she prepares uh, to lead us on next Sunday. We will be praying uh, for sure as well. Our benediction this morning is this. This is the God we adore. Our faithful, unchangeable friend whose love is as great as is power. Father, this morning we thank you. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you for your love and for your grace. And as we leave here this morning, Father, we pray you will go with us, guide us, and protect us. May we be a light shining brightly for you in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen.